this little thing, you don't have to go to heaven to even pick it up. I mean, you can do whatever you want to, but one of the things that I do at Granola is hand out stuff like this. Every sermon is either in the bulletin or it's in the evening thing. Some pick them up, some don't. That, that, I don't worry about that. But a lot of folk uh, stick them in their Bibles and take them home. Uh, I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying here's a practice. And I called up Given the other day and I said, is it okay to do that? And he said, it's a free world and so you got them. <laughs> now because some of us here uh, have known one another quite a good long time, some of us almost 40 years. Uh, I know some of you don't know me from Adam or Eve either one, but some of you do. And because that is true, permit me to take just a moment and tell you a couple of things about my own personal life. Most of you know that some years back my wife suffered a stroke. She had been getting better, but in recent months, in fact in the month of June, she had what they call a TIA, that's a transient ischemic attack. It was uh, transient uh, in, the, in and of itself, but what it did, it caused a spasm in one of the major arteries in her uh, skull and brought on Bell's palsy. Now, if some of you have ever seen that or been around that, you know it's very disfiguring, among other things, and it's painful. And so the last six weeks now, we've been sort of struggling with that, uh, among other things. But she is a little better. She's at the doctor now. That's where she is this afternoon. Uh, but one of the problems that both the early stroke and this one brought on is her inability to handle heat of any variety. Uh, and for instance, now this is very comfortable for me. It would not do for her at all. She, she couldn't handle it in here at all. It has to, she'd have to have a fan on her, uh, even sitting in here. She can't handle it at all. Makes her sick. So uh, I just tell you that, uh, not trying to get sympathy. I just, some of you have asked me. Uh, I need to tell you that much so you all can hear it. Then a second thing that might be of interest to some of you uh, is that this past summer, um, some of you have asked about this, so I'll, re I'll tell you all at once. I was with a group of people who went to Budapest, Hungary for three weeks. Uh, whatever may be said in the standard about short-term missionary works, so I can all inveigh on the side of profitableness for short-term things, mm -hmm. as well as the long ones. And I'm not trying to debate the issue. I'm just, I've been there. The brethren who invited us over there were Church Christ people, non-instrumental people. There were five couples and some others over there. And during the month of June and into July, they had, they offered free lessons in English for anyone who would come. Well, you can guess where the lessons from English came from, right out of the Bible. And that's what we taught them. Uh, for three weeks and better, right out of the Bible. And here they had lessons to prepare and lessons to study and questions to answer. And of course, we taught them English. We, we taught the difference between was and were and all that kind of thing. <laughs> but along the same lines, along the same lines, we taught them about the Bible. And after that, of course, then you make all kinds of contacts out of that. And the, the brethren over there then took those people who wanted to continue the study, both in English and in the Bible, and so the church is growing over there. And I think you need to know that, that here's a way to, here's a way to do it. It isn't the only way to do things, but it is a way to do things. One of the people there that uh, was my, uh, you had five personal students every day, and then maybe more kind of depend on how it went. But one of my personal students was an older gentleman, 72, by the name of Peter Nadash. Peter had been a had been in the army in World War II uh, in the uh, German army, we'll say for want of something better here. And he was captured by the Russians uh, in the middle of the war, taken into Poland and then into Russia. And he remarked uh, in one of our conversations that he would uh, probably be dead almost with all the rest of those people that were taken captive with him in that one little group, he said, except he said, I think the Lord was with me. He said, he, he didn't leave me in Poland. They took him into Russia, and he was down in a, a, some kind of a ditch or something, and couldn't quite decide what, and it caved in on him and broke his collarbone. And because the Russians did not want to mess with him, and that was his term, not mine, they sent him back home to uh, Hungary. Well, uh, one of the first questions they asked me was, he said, Wallace, he never could get the W out. You know, he's learned German, he speaks German fluently. And so Wallace is always Wallace, like Volkswagen, that kind of a thing. He said, Wallace, he said, do you hate me? 
well, no, Peter, I don't hate you. Why should I hate you? Uh, you know, that's kind of an innocent question, but I wanted him to say. Well, then we got in a discussion about the United States versus Hungary and Russia, but then we got into Christianity and said, Peter, I don't hate you because my Bible tells me I shouldn't hate you. And so that led from one thing to another. Well, okay, just that much. One of the things for some of you like, who know that I like linguistics, one of the first questions or one of the first statements you made to me he said, of Alice, he said, he said, language is the soul of the people. And I thought, I've got one <laughs> right here. Now, some of you don't like language, okay, so you can pass that one by. Okay. <clears throat> Well, then the third little thing that might be of some interest to you, um, you some of you know that I am preaching in my home congregation. It's where I grew up. It's the very first place I ever went as a little boy. It's the only place I've ever gone uh, in, in that sense of the term. I and my wife were married there, and we had our children there, quote, and, and we've grown up with some of those people. Some of those people I've known since, since I've known anybody. I mean, they've known me, and I know them. You can't fool anybody down there. I mean, they, they, they don't, they just don't try to because they know better. <laughs> well, anyway... I tell you that to say that after my wife and I left in 1958, uh, and ultimately wound up down here at Joplin and stayed a while till 86. <clears throat> for some of you students, I never learned enough from school to get away from it, uh, really, it's for a long time. But anyway, uh, we went back to Granola in 1988 quite unexpectedly. I didn't expect to go, and I never thought it would last. We've been there since then, going on to year number eight, and just recently, um, the elders and deacons met, and I had sort of wondered if they were thinking about replacing me. I'm 62 and not getting any younger uh, at all. And they said, Wallace, uh, as far as we're concerned, you can stay as long as you can minister down here. We're not looking to retire you anywhere or any time. So I just pass that on for whatever it's worth. You know, things are, as Gavin said, things are going well down there. Not necessarily it's because of me, but I'm interested in what the church wants to do broadly as well as otherwise, that much information. Let's talk about the blood of the covenant. The texts that were signed, um, and Brother Dallas is going to talk about those tomorrow night too, are on that little handout that you have there. There are three of them. The one in 920 talks about the blood of the covenant, speaking about an old covenant, an old testament. You know about that one. The other two relate to the covenant that you and I are part of and have been, have been uh, exhorted about. In the classroom where I spent some time, when you walk into a classroom as a teacher, you think about a lot of things, don't you? You think about knowledge that the students don't have and need. Uh, you think about direction that they need to take aside from just knowledge of which, which way we're going here. What, what are you, where's your thinking? Uh, how are you thinking? Not only what, but how. You think about methodology and all that sort of thing. You think to some extent, uh, maybe some classes more than others, you think about motivating them. So every once in a while you pound the pulpit and preach to them. But a lot of times they want, they want something to write down in that notebook so they can take it out here and we're going to do something with it. When you get into a congregation, especially your home congregation where you can't fool anybody, you think a whole lot more about motivation than you do about the other things. It isn't so much that they're not important. I'm not arguing the point, but I'm talking about how do you motivate the couple, for instance, that you grew up with to be more Christ-like in their life. You're not going to convince them they're not Christian. That won't work. How do you get them into gear is an easy way to state it. So I think more about motivation than I used to in a classroom. I don't dismiss the other things. Over the wintertime, I taught four classes and preached two sermons every week, so I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not just sliding by here. But in a church setting, as opposed to a college setting, say, for instance, you think about motivation. I got to think about these covenants. Given wrote me a little note and talked about some of the things he wanted to accomplish in a meeting like this. Got to think about motivation. So you may see from that little outline there that I, I want to think about covenants as God's grace to us. That's what it is. It isn't anything we deserve, and you know that, so we'll not reiterate on that. It is God's grace to people like you and me. The fact that he gave two of them is of interest and can be discussed, but that really isn't kind of what I want to do either. I want us to think this more this afternoon about what covenants mean to people like you and me. Over the years, like most preachers, I've had part in many weddings, dozens of them by now. And as the older I get, the more that I, I look at that young couple standing there and, and think, do you know what you're doing? 
I thought I knew what I was doing 40-some years back. And I guess it did, in a way. But I had to learn to love my wife. Oh, I loved her at the time. I'd have probably killed anybody that said I didn't otherwise. But I'm talking about I had to learn to love my wife. Amen. Amen. And she had to learn to love me. We hadn't been married very long until she said, Wallace, she said, I can see that you're not perfect. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> I'm glad the Lord finally took the blinders off of whoever did. But, but, but she had to learn to love me uh, for who I am. I had to learn to love her. And when the stroke came along, I had to learn to love her again. You, you keep right on loving her. When you say, I take her for better or for worse, you have to learn what that means. And you're going to have to stay with it. I've known fellows who walked into the hospital room and saw their wife in some condition and said, I can't handle it, and I'm gone. Now, some of you have too. Well, covenants are that way. Covenants are between a man and a woman. They're between us and God. We've already had that worked on. But I, I list some things there that covenants mean to me personally. Well, they talk about blood. That's part of the text here that you can read. I'm not going to read them for you. But blood talks about sacrifice. And sacrifice talks about, in this case, death. We're not just talking about transfusions. We're talking about death of something. Yes, amen. We're talking about the cessation of existence of something, willingly or otherwise. I don't know that any of the bulls, the young bulls, the text says in Exodus 24, that they killed when the first law was put into effect, the first covenant. I don't know if any of them were willing or not, but they lost their lives just the same. To put into effect a covenant between God and and people like you and me. We may, in some sense of the term, denigrate the covenant. And I use that term advisedly here, please. But it was the finest man ever had up to that point in time. There was none equal to it. Amen. There was none equal to it. Came from God with love. I don't know all the things that he had in mind for it. I could guess at some. We've already had some presented. But it came from God with love to those people who surely needed to be loved. Amen. After the covenant was first given, as you very well know, and they, they decided they would do it. We will do it. Moses took some of the blood that was left, half of it, the text says, and sprinkled on the people. We're members of covenant. We're together in this business. But in the book of Deuteronomy, as some of you very well know, Moses told those people, he said, you have been rebellious since the day that I knew you. You have been that way. Oh, they were willing. They surely were willing. Looked like good things to come. Enough to eat and enough to drink for the rest of my life. But they were rebellious people. The book of Numbers says, that God speaking, said, you've rebelled against me ten times. I can't even count them. They're not late, but that's what he said anyway. And so it went. Last Sunday's Sunday school lesson in, in the international lessons has, has the book of Hosea. How can I give you up, Ephraim, God says. Yeah. Well, it was a heartfelt cry, but the fact of it is he could and he did give up on them. That's the fact. Covenants. How does one serve a covenant like that? Well, by duty, that's how. And I list some of the things for you. And by honor, that's how you do that. You serve by relationships. You serve by citizenship. You serve by mindset. You serve by life and for life and with life. And you surely serve for destiny. Mm -hmm. To affirm that the Mosaic Covenant was given without any destiny in mind is to affirm badly. There was a destiny in mind for these people. Galatians 4.24, and I quote some of it for you there. Paul writing to Galatian people said, are you aware of the fact, they were, but rhetorical thing, are you aware of the fact that Abraham had two sons? He always had to say that one of them, he said, was the son of a slave woman. And he said that, that, that figuratively represents two covenants. One of them is Mount Sinai. And he said her children are to be, present tense, are to be slaves. I wonder if any of the people at Mount Sinai, the real one, the actual one, ever knew that the covenant that they were receiving would make them a slave. Maybe a good one, but still a slave. I wondered if they thought that. I don't know what they thought, but let's suppose that they did. 
think that the covenant was in some measure enslaving. I don't know how they did with that. But when Jesus came on the scene and said in John chapter 8, to those Jews, the text says in verse 31, who had believed in him, he said, if you believe in me, he said, you will keep my word. And he said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And their immediate response, I suppose, was, why, we've never been a slave to anyone. Yes, he said, you have, and you are. Slaves. How does one serve a covenant of slavery? Well, I put some other texts down there for you. But in thinking along these lines, how did the covenant come? Oh, it came with great happenings. The book of Exodus 19, uh, Hebrews 12, a mountain that could not be touched. I, I've looked at pictures of Mount Sinai. I've never been, but I looked at pictures. But how could it be that you're not to touch this mountain? Uh, where does the mountain start? No, it's not just rock right up like a wall over there. Where does the mountain start? It was covered with cloud and darkness and, and blackness and thunder and lightning. And the text says, and a trumpet that just continually grew louder. And the people, the text says, in Exodus begged Moses to have God stop speaking to them. That might have been the first time that people begged for God to stop speaking, but it sure wasn't the last one. You know, it might be down to 1995. Do we want God to speak to us? I don't know about that, but that's another sermon another time. Moses said, if you folk think you're scared, I'm scared too. He said, I'm trembling with fear. The covenant came with great things. It was an attempt, I suppose, to get the people's attention, among other things. But see, I'm supposing, I don't know that. But God gave it, and they decided to accept it. Covenants are always two-sided in that sense. But the text in Hebrews 11, and you may read it down there on your, on your list if you will, the covenant that they accepted, the Hebrew writer says, they served well. And he said, time would fail to tell me of people like Gideon, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, and David, and Samuel. And, and he said, the prophets, all of whom, he said, served under this covenant. And he said, they conquered kingdoms, and they administered justice, and they gained, he said, what was promised. And that's the important little phrase. They gained what was promised. There, there was life and destiny out there at the end of that covenant. We might see it as truncated, as, as being temporal, and it surely was that. But for those people under that covenant, at the foot of the mountain, there were other things involved. There was life and destiny out there. David, all of you know enough about David just to mention his name a little bit. David, his men said, was worth 10,000 of them. Well, I don't know, that might have been a bit of a... But their estimate of, estimate of David, despite some of his problems, was surely high. Sweet singer of Israel, the man after Samuel told Saul, the man that God's looking for. You recall that Saul did what was wrong and Samuel comes to Saul and says, Saul, God would have established your kingdom. But he said, now, he said, God's looking for a man after his own heart. And that man, of course, was David. Two chapters later, Saul goes and anoints, Samuel goes and anoints him and so we start. This covenant, as you well know, out of 2 Corinthians 3, came with glory. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered what that meant, glory. Does it mean the mountain and the fire and all that? Well, maybe. Maybe that's glory. I don't know. It surely came with God's blessing upon them. It, it came with glory. But yet, we know that it was, it was a covenant with building obsolescence. It was already fading away, even as it was given. Amen. We know that. Whether they knew that or not... I think the text in 2 Corinthians 3 seems to say that Moses, in some way, we might call it intuition, if you like, understood that what he was getting and giving was not going to last, but I don't, that's a guess. But in any case, we know that it was passing away. What would it do, other than have us know about people like David and all those guys? Well, as we well know from... Paul and Galatians, it would bring men to the feet of Jesus, wouldn't it? That's yeah. where it would bring them. Amen. That's where it would bring them. 
And I suppose Philip expresses it as well as anybody when he said to Nathaniel, he said, Nathaniel, he said, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets spoke, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We have found him. Amen. We found him. How would they find him otherwise? They wouldn't find him in the heathen religions around him, that's for sure. They wouldn't find him anywhere in the world today outside of where Christianity, they won't find him. They would find him in the law. Now Paul goes ahead to say in the text of Galatians that there is a Jerusalem and it is above, but that first covenant, what did it do for people? Well, it yoked people with God. That's a pretty good yoke, I think. Mm -hmm. we, might, we might decide that the Christian life is so much better, and quote Matthew 11, say, take my yoke upon you and all that kind of thing. But it made people in relationship with God, they surely wouldn't have sustained anywhere else and surely could not get anywhere else. And all these people, I suggest to you, were proud to serve. Proud to be a part of a covenant that would lead them somewhere. When I study, for instance, the early account in Luke, and here comes this blessed old man who's looking for the consolation of Israel. What a covenant did he live under? He lived under the one we're talking about. But it, it still made him look ahead. It made him live by faith, and that's what the text in Hebrews says. It made you live by faith. Well, how else could you do it? We might decide they're all sinful and they're all slaves. That's true. So what's the difference between them and us? Not much. But the business of living by faith, that's what it inculcated in them. A God who's beyond them. We look beyond the world in which we live. We look beyond the, the present day. We look to the world out there somewhere. How about being yoked together with the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? That'd be a pretty good yoke. Most of them are proud of that, rightfully so. The kind of thing that I think we need to consider as we look it, uh, as I think about it, think about the law, what God gave, what he attempted to do. It might not be any wonder that Campbell could preach three hours in his sermon on the law. I'm sure there's more to be said in his talking about the law. But I, I want us to think this is from God. This is not something that Moses figured out. It is from God. And it would produce the one who would take away the sin of the world. That's what it would produce. It would lead men there. That's what it would do. It would produce the one... Jesus said, none born greater than this man, woman, who was not fit to loosen the sandal lace on the pierced feet of Jesus, but it would produce that person. That's what it would produce. Well, let's talk about Jerusalem from above. Paul says about that other son, that son of, not Hagar, but the other lady, the, other lady, the free lady, Sarah, that son, that son and his mother represent Jerusalem that is from above, Paul says. And if you will read in your text there, it will say and, and to the Galatian people, now you, he said, are like Isaac. You are children of promise. Mm -hmm. That's who you are out here, yeah. you folk. Uh, and yours truly stand up here. The text that Given chose talk about the blood of an eternal covenant. That's chapter 13 and verse 20. Well, we know that's in contrast to this temporal one about which we just finished thinking about. It's an eternal one. I don't need to impress that on this audience, I don't suppose. But in thinking about that eternal covenant, the question, and David quoted the text this morning a couple of times in Hebrews 10, how much more severely the international has it? Who is worth the punishment that will come from not taking advantage of this new covenant. Mm -hmm. Who's worth that? That is, we're talking about equality here. Who's going to meet that judgment? What will the punishment be? The Hebrew writer asks the question, how, but he really doesn't answer it. He never ever answers really what's going to happen to those who do all the things in verse 29. He doesn't answer that. He just suggests it. I have thought, is it, is it like, for instance, the... Revelation 6 text where the people there want the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the face of him who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. Is it like that? Is it like verse 26 and 27 of Hebrews 10, the fearful expectation of judgment? Is it that? Is it the Matthew 7 text where Jesus says, Depart from me, evildoers, and you put it with Matthew 25, into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing. Is it that? But he doesn't answer that. 
maybe it is not for us to speculate, but I want to turn it around and think about who can escape that. Who's worth the covenant is a way to ask the question. Not who's worth the punishment. Yeah. Who's worth the covenant? Who will live up to the covenant? Who will honor the covenant? Who will be a yoke fellow with God in the covenant? Who will take Jesus' yoke and, and be equal to that yoke that he has? Who Amen. is that? Amen. Because the text is the worthiness. So I want us to think a little bit this morning about worthiness. If it is true that people who despise the Holy Spirit who wrote the letter that tells them about Jesus, if it is true that they deserve judgment, whatever kind, if it is true that they treat the blood of the covenant as a common thing, that koinonia, that, that common thing, rather than something special and personal and holy, and uh, it is treated as common. And Jesus is but the welcome mat that they wipe their feet on, as David said so well this morning. If those people deserve judgment, how am I going to skip it? Well, let's be worthy of the covenant is the way to, as I said, to answer the question. Let's live up to the covenant. Who's going to be worthy of the covenant that came with so great a price? Oh, maybe Jesus ought to talk a little bit. He said in Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 37, that he who loves father or mother more than... Here's the positive affirmation. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. There's the same word for you, all you Greek students, but beside the point. He's not worthy of me, that person, whoever that is. He who loves son or daughter, what's dearer than your children? Except maybe your wife. I'm not trying to be funny or anything. I'm just talking about what's dearer than your family. But that person is not worthy of me. And Jesus says, he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So how am I going to skip the punishment? Oh, be worthy of Jesus. That, Amen. I'm going to have to put first things first, as we say, and second things Amen. second. Amen. Living up to the covenant. Um, most of you know, no, most of you don't know, most of you do not know, some of you know, that I grew up on a farm. I'm a farmer at heart and a preacher by trade. That's probably an honest evaluation. Down where I preach, it's, it, it used to be, when I was a little boy, almost all agricultural. Well, it isn't so much that way anymore. We have people work at Boeing and other places around. But a lot of the brethren in the congregation, or would-be brethren, suspects and all those, are, are, are agricultural in one fashion or another, sometimes two or three things. We talked with a fellow talked this morning about being usable, ministering. That's how you get a suntan. You know, you drive a tractor. That's what I grew up doing, driving a tractor. The guys down there need all kinds of tractor work. You mow hay and turn wheat stubble under and plant wheat and all the kinds of things that you do with a tractor. Or you do a lot of other things that agricultural people need. I, I know about that. Well, I'm not an expert in cattle or any of those things, but I understand very well what it means to be in a farming community. And so in, uh, some of my best preaching is done in overalls and with dirt on my face and grease on my hands because that's where Monday evening at 7.30 before I get in the house because I was down way off down south of Granola disking some wheat stubble under for a fellow. Some of these days I'm going to immerse. I quit baptizing many years back. I immerse them all now. But in any case... Uh, <laughs> And, and, a, and a disc went out of the bearing. Uh, you sure did. The uh, bearing went out of the disc, and so he was gone, so I pulled it up to the house and started taking it apart. Well, he comes, and so we take the bearing out of the disc. So guess what kind of a... You know, I've got the guy right there. Well, I didn't say anything about Christianity. I just showed him how a Christian worked when you bump your fingers on something. You know, you hit him on the disc, and it's all sharp. Or the, or the nut won't come off the bolt because it's rusted. How does a Christian work under these circumstances? That's really what he wants to know. He doesn't want to really know if I can preach a great sermon. It really wants to know, hey, W.W., how is it out here where I live all the time? That's what he wants to know. And if I can't show him out there, he's probably not going to come up where I preach. He's not going to be interested in that. That's where, the, as we say, the rubber meets the road. It's the kind of thing that puts... I think practical Christianity before people. Here's the way you live. 
Oh, I can sit down and write stuff on a computer and send it to wherever. But for most of those people there, they'll never read it. That's not what they're interested in. They're interested in, can I put Christianity out where they are? That's really what they want to know. How do I live up to the covenant? It is another way of stating the same point. How can I be a Christian out here? Where, where you're talking about $150 for a little you know, bearing at a desk. Well, how many of you have $150 to spare right this minute? But he has to go buy it. Just the same. He says, we won't get any disking done if he doesn't. The kind of thing that you run down in the barn and, and, and try to find if he has what... Living up to the covenant. I thought a little bit about uh, how one does this. How does one... Well, for instance, let me go ahead and talk about this fellow. He has both sheep and goats, as well as cattle and farmland. And I watch the sheep and the goats. And they come down in the alfalfa field where I'm working the stove. And I watch them. The covenant of which we are privileged to have a part it has a great shepherd, the text says. And John 10 says that he will provide for everyone who's a member of that covenant. Amen. You know the text in John 10. The shelter and the food and the protection. No one can do what now? Snatch them out of my hands. No one can do that. Amen. That's a covenant which I'm a part. Amen. Amen. How do I live up to that? Well, probably not jumping out of his hands, please, or his father's hands, as the case may be. No, let's not get too active here. I, I need energy. I need. I need to work off some of this stuff you have. You know, you lose something, you gain some as life goes by, don't you? It's okay. You can laugh. You do lose some. You lose some up here and gain some. But anyway, <laughs> thinking about how does one do this? Well, may I just suggest for you then that, that two of the fellows who could really talk about this much better than I, two fellows named Peter and Paul, they lived under both of them. Yeah. What did they have to say about the covenants, the blood of the covenant, what it took to make the first covenant go, what it took to make the second covenant go, so much so that the first one is obsolete and no longer there. How do you live under both of those covenants? Which one do you like the best? Is it better to be here than there? Most of us could quote this text from Paul in Acts 26. He said, I verily thought, King James Wise, he said, I verily thought that I ought to do how many things contrary to the name of Jesus? Verily ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. And that. I would kick against the goads. Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever seen that? You've read the text, but have you ever seen that happen? Oh, I have. Literally, kicking against the goad. Saul said, that's where I was. I was kicking against the goad. But Saul, bless his heart, found a treasure in the field, didn't he? Amen. Amen. He found a treasure in the field. I thought about that some out in that field, 240 acres of wheat ground out there. I thought of finding a treasure out there. Any out here? You, you know that kind of thing. But Jesus talked about finding a treasure. And the next one is the pearl of greatest price. And sold everything he had by the pearl. It was the greatest, it is what he wanted all of his life. Saul of Tarsus finally found that. Kicking against the goads. What are you looking for, Saul? I'm looking for the pearl of greatest price. Thought I had it. Oh, no. A fellow named Floyd Hawkins picked up on that little thing of John 1 and the text in Matthew 13, and he wrote, I discovered the way of gladness. He said, I found a pearl of greatest price, eternal life so fair. It was through the Savior's sacrifice I found this jewel rare. That's the second verse. And then he goes ahead to say, I've discovered the way of gladness. I've discovered the way of joy. I've discovered relief. Always looking for that. From sadness, tis a happiness without alloy. And I thought about alloy. And here's David sitting down here with us, all his metal skills. What is, what is happiness without alloy? I don't know that I understand. Oh, I understand it academically, maybe, but he would understand it. What is pure gold? I discovered the fount of blessing, he said. I discovered the living word. It was the greatest of all discoveries when I found Jesus, my Lord. Amen. And he created everything he had for it. Amen. And I don't think he ever looked back. I thought about different kinds of people in the kingdom. I'm one. 
Charles Gresham's another, and Gavin Blakely's another, and we're all different. I thought about Saul of Tarsus. What did he need when he became a Christian? To live up to the covenant that he, he just sort of discovered. Oh, he needed to Barnabas, and God supplied it. Yes. Here's Barnabas, the son of exhortation, who can exhort Saul when he's probably up and down like this. My, all the guilt. You know, voice of sermon this morning. All the things that Saul had in his closet. Who needed to work him through that? Oh, Barnabas, Joseph by name. But it's interesting, names that you give people, isn't it? The things you, you I'm W.W. in a lot of places, some of you, uh, or Wally or whatever. That, that's the way you know me. Joseph, that Levite who sold South 40, I guess, and brought it to the feet of the apostles, he was of such character that they renamed him. And Barnabas is that name. Oh, he wasn't the son of a fellow named Barnabas, I suppose, or Nabosh, maybe it would be. He, that's just the man's, that, that's summing up the man's character. That's who he is. What did Saul need? Oh, he needed somebody to, come on, Saul. Come on, Saul. It's okay, Saul. They won't accept you in Jerusalem, but I will. You got a friend. I'll be your friend. Well, Peter said in Acts 15, in a rather large and important discussion there, he said, men, why are you testing God? That's an important phrase. Yes. Why are you testing God? He said, we couldn't live under that covenant. He said, it's a burden we couldn't bear. Now talk about slavery. See, we're back to John 8. We're talking about slaves. We couldn't bear the covenant. Oh, maybe stooped along. Were they ever looking for freedom? You know they were. Men, why are you doing that? <clears throat> I thought about worthiness, and we're still thinking about that just a little bit. I quoted the text in Matthew 10. Jesus told a parable <clears throat> at the end of a rather long series of parables in Matthew 22 about a king who gave a great feast for his son. He invited everybody to come, and you know very good and well they didn't come. And the king says in Matthew 22 and verse 8, he said to his servants, he said, I want you to go out, he said, into the streets and the byways. And he said, get people to come, because he said, those that I invited, he said, were not worthy to come. They decided not to come. Worthy of the covenant. They voted against it with their feet. Imagine missing a king's banquet, but they decided they were not worthy of that. And that's what he decided, too. That's what he did. Worthy of the covenant. They could have come. It was free. Paul, I'll bet that first missionary journey was something to read about in his notes, if he kept a diary. But when you recall, he got to Antioch, and he preached there, and my had a great reception. Everybody said, yay, yay, we'll come back the next Sunday, and the house was full. But you know, in Acts 13 and verse 45, that the Jews were jealous. And they, they just raised such a ruckus that it, I suppose he couldn't get through. I don't know for sure how that meeting went. But Paul said in Acts 13 and verse 46, he said, it was necessary, he said. It was necessary, he said, that we go to you first. But he said, seeing that you've judged yourselves unworthy of the covenant, unworthy of this good news, he said, lo, we turn to the nations. And we've been going ever since. Because they judged themselves unworthy, same word. Who's worthy of the punishment? Acts 13, 46 will tell you some of them. Judge themselves unworthy of being saved. Unworthy of being free. Unworthy of being any of the things. I thought about worthiness. And then I thought about worthlessness. Those terms go together. The 20th century New Testament in Acts chapter 17, when Paul's on that journey, uh, and, and the Jews, the text says, Luke writing, says that they, they went down to the marketplace in verse 5, and he said they got some, and here's 20th century, they got some worthless men. Now, most of the versions say evil or bad or something along that line, but I, I like that little turn of thought. 
They got some worthless men and they assaulted the house of Jason, raised all kinds of trouble. Have you ever met anybody worthless? Well, I don't suppose the, the people there in Acts 17 are the only worthless people that ever lived. Do you? You think that's the only bunch that ever was worthless or evil or bad? I've known one or two I thought was rather worthless. Just not, as they would sound, say down in my country, not worth the pattern child to take to shoot them. That was, maybe you've never heard that, but that's what they say <laughs> down there. <laughs> Who's worthy of the covenant? Well, all those except those who need to be shot. That's who's worthy of the covenant. The rest of them, forget it. In Acts 14, Paul's at Lystra. And those people there thought that he was so great, he and Barnabas, that they wanted to do what to them? They wanted to sacrifice for them, didn't they? And the text says, verse 14, that the, the, the men, Paul and Mars, just tore their garments. I don't know what that means, but it's what the text says. They just tore their garments and sprang out among the people and said, Men, men, why are you doing this? We're just humans like you are. He said, We have come to bring you good news to turn from these worthless things. That's what we came for. But the text says they scarcely, King James Version, they scarcely restrained them from sacrificing. Worthless people. Oh, we're saving, I, I know all that. But I, I'm thinking about the text in Hebrews 10, verse 29, that says, who is going to be worthy of the punishment? And the answer comes back, all those who will not be worthy of the covenant. That's the answer that the Hebrew writer never gives. That's who's worthy. Why are you doing this? Sometimes I think that about myself. W.W., why are you doing this? Well, a friend of mine named Seth, years ago in class, used to quote a little poem. I quote it every now and then. Let me hold lightly things of this earth. Transient treasures, what are they worth? Moth can corrupt, rust can decay, all their bright beauty fade in a day. Let me hold lightly temporal things. I who am deathless, I who have wings, he'd say. It's Amen. like that. That's the way he'd go. I haven't forgotten that. I who have wings. Amen. Let me hold tightly, as if my life depended on it. And it does. That's not in the poem, but it does. Let me hold tightly, Lord. Things of the skies, quicken my vision, open Amen. my eyes. Amen. Show me your beauty, your glory, your grace. Endless Amen. is time and boundless is space. And the last two little lines. Let me hold lightly things that are mine. You have given me, Lord, all that is thine. Worthy to come? Yeah. Amen. But I'm going to have to see that. My, one of my sisters sitting down here, her name's Colleen. We just have gone through last month back. Our parents are both dead now, and we really haven't done anything with, with the stuff. The house still has stuff in it. I'll guarantee you this, as we stood there and looked at the stuff that our parents had accumulated over a lifetime of marriage, that little poem ran through my mind. Mm -hmm. Let me hold lightly. Are we going to argue over it? Are we going to have a knockdown and drag out over this stuff? Our parents have sure been disappointed if we had it, I'll guarantee you that. They were Christian enough to not want us to fight over it. But they didn't give us any direction. So two brothers and two sisters sat down and talked about some things. Take them all. Oh, I grant you that I, I, I'm attached to some of them. I don't want to see any of you folk down there taking them. That sure would disturb me. <laughs> but, but do you understand what I'm talking about? Let me hold lightly these things, and if my brother and my sisters decide I need none of them and take them all, okay. I am neither richer nor poor. Isn't that what Luke 15 or 12, 15 says? A man's life does not hold together in the what? The abundance of things which he possesses or his folks have left him. That isn't my life. But that's living worthy of the covenant, isn't it? That's thinking where the covenant is. Amen. Amen. That's thinking about the Christian perspective. Amen. Holy Scott out at school, he used to be out at school, one of the trustees years ago, he, he would say, WW, would say, give it all away, he said, then you won't worry about it when you die. <laughs> So 
songwriters have tried to catch on this theme, and I think of, of many of the songs that would talk about our relationship to God, what he's done for us to make us equal to the covenant. R. Stanfall, among the others that I like, wrote a song entitled Unworthy. Unworthy am I, he said, of the grace that he gave. Unworthy to cling to his hand. Just think about the, the dad and the little child. Unworthy to cling to his hand. Amazed, he said, that a king would reach down to a slave. This love, he said, I, I can't, I cannot understand. And then the refrain, unworthy. Unworthy, a beggar in bondage and alone. And then this little phrase, Stanford picked up on the right thing, but he made me worthy. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's, that's the essence of the gospel. Amen. He made me worthy, and now by his grace, his mercy has made me his own. My part of it and God's part of it. <clears throat> Last night, we sang a song, and I thought about it. <clears throat> this man wrote this song. Some of you will know about this, and others of you won't. But this man wrote this song, was born in 1792. That was a pretty interesting year to be born in. Things were happening on the continent, though he was born in England. And at the age of 16, I am told that he could speak five languages, had learned them without a teacher. That's no small achievement. Throughout his lifetime, because of his ability, he became wealthy. So he was a financier. He gave money away. Uh, he was a statesman because of money and all the things that went with that, not because he necessarily bought it, but here's one of the things that goes with it. In 1854, he was made governor of Hong Kong, and in that same year was knighted by Queen Elizabeth. Along about that same time, he took a journey around the south coast of China, and he came to a city called Macau. I suppose that's the way it's pronounced. I don't know that, but it's M-A-C-A-O, so Macau, okay? And as he came into the harbor, so the story goes, he, he looked up in the harbor, and, and on one side of the harbor, the Portuguese settlers of years before him had built a great monastery and, and place of worship and all that, I suppose. And in, in a wall next to the harbor, they'd built a great big wall, and up on top of that wall, they'd put a big brass cross. So that when he came into the harbor, that's what you saw. But a typhoon had come along, and I'd taken it all the way, except that wall, and that cross. John Bowring looked at that wall and that cross, and he wrote, in the cross of Christ I glory, towering yes. o'er the wrecks of time, Amen. all the light of sacred story gathers round where? Its head sublime. Yes. Bane and blessing, pain and pleasure, how? By the cross are sanctified. So my wife's pain, whatever pleasure we might have had, sanctified by the cross. Amen. Peace is there. That what? Knows no, no, measure. no measure. There's a good scriptural expression. Amen. Joy that through all time abides. No passing joy here. John Bowring died. He was a famous fellow in his day. But the one thing we remember him for is that song that he wrote. The words of that song, In the Cross of Christ Our Glory, are inscribed on his tombstone. He probably captured in that song, as well as anyone, what it means to consider two covenants, the blood of each one of them, what did it cost to get this one into operation? What did God do here? What did it cost to get this one into operation? What did God do here? And then decide for this one. Amen. And then decide for this one. And like Paul, and I put the text down there at the bottom of your little paper. As for me, King James has God forbid, and I sometimes wonder if they didn't catch the sentiment, even though that isn't a very good translation. May it never be that I should glory, I, 